Bag Simmons. Hello. In for part two. Why do you keep doing the introduction ah, and going listen, to open something? It's my fucking show. Maybe your venue. <laughs> it's my show, right? Uh, do you know why it is? Because I know in my studio, mm. if I crack that, it's not going to be heard. I'm not oh, sure right. in you. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> you need some sound effects. You need some foley. Yeah. Anyway. In for part two. <clears throat> so you came in uh, in 2018. Was it that long ago? Late 2018, I think, yeah. Wow. Um, we were talking before the icebreaker, and, uh, yeah, we were talking before the icebreaker about, so, you, some, oh, you can correct me in a minute, yeah. or pick up the story, but you were saying that uh, we were talking about the stunt double for Chewbacca, who I think y you know, or somehow was, anyway, stunt double for Chewbacca in recent Star Wars movies, right? And I was saying that, cannot be a good pickup line for ladies, right? And then I rethought it. I, well, you disagreed. I want you to imagine this. Sorry, are you, sorry. what am I, I, I supposed to speak No, about? no, sorry, no, no, no. I was just thinking... You, I, you I, got, th that, 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 that was a very long pause there. I thought, fuck, have no, I missed a question? Yeah, can you imagine? Uh, it's only in one circumstance it's bad. Yeah. You're texting with a dude. Well, you're a lady. You're texting with a dude. Oh, right, it's going okay. back and forth, being introduced. Yeah. Maybe you met on a drunk night the night before. Yeah, yeah. Nothing's happened, and you're like, oh, yeah, and you can't remember much. And and he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a stunt double for Chewbacca. Yeah. I would not be impressed with that. Why not? That's Can really you, cool. Think of the kind of person you'd, if, you'd if ima said imagine. I was, I was the stunt double for R2-D2, that's, like, that's less cool. That's a bit like, what? That's just a wheelie bin they pushed down the stairs. But the stunt double for Chewbacca, he's massive for a start. He's like nearly seven He's feet. He's hairy. Yeah, Chewbacca is. He's unusually large. A lot of ladies like dogs. So this is like the per <laughs> that's the per <laughs> that's that? That's the How does that link the perfect in combination? There are, there are a lot of, so uh, two you, seconds by your logic. Yeah. A lot of ladies like dogs. Is, is your logical con conclusion that a lot of ladies, the ladies that like dogs like hairy men? No, well, that's what I it sounded like th that. I hadn't thought about it before, but I'm thinking it's, <laughs> clearly there are there are people on the internet who, believe it or not, have very broad tastes. And there's a group called Furries. I'm going to pretend like I don't know what this is. Furries. Oh, I've yeah, heard of these. Yeah, and, and but and even even if that explain the, the case, furries. Furries, as far as I know, and apologies to anybody out there who is one, and I've got this completely wrong, but they like to dress up as furry animals. In order to, <clears throat> you know, the uh, yeah, the cats and that it's like cats, cat sex. They have sex like uh, they dress up like cats or dogs, and they have sex like cats or dogs, right? I don't know. If they have well, sex they make like the noises. They make the noises like meow, um, meow. That's good. Is that <laughs> 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 You can sell this, as we say, with the ASMR. You can sell this. There are people on the internet. People are dropping off this podcast right now. This is taking average turn. listening time, 33 seconds. <laughs> anyway, uh, how do you know the Chewbacca guy? So it was through um, Team Rubicon. Why don't you pull that mic into you? Keep leaning forward. You can lean back then. There you go. Because I want to have space to move around. There you go. So um, I was... I was in Haiti with Team Rubicon and um, a text came through saying we are looking for a stunt double for a character and the character has, has to be, and I, I can't remember the exact height, but somewhere around about six foot seven. And this person needs to be athletic, um, uh, but complexion look is not a problem is not an issue doesn't come into it which is always a bit weird because how somebody looks always comes into casting and it said it was filming in Shepparton in England and I or Pinewood I can't remember now but I was I was I was looking at all the details and I was like this is a strange casting this has got to be Star Wars because I knew Star Wars was about to start filming um The Force Awakens and um height wise I was like well it's got to be either Darth Vader or Chewbacca because they said look isn't important so um I happened to be in Haiti with a guy called Steve when I got this and Steve went oh I've got a mate who's an ex-professional golfer um here's a picture of him and he showed me the picture and the guy just looks normal but massive 
Tall, like, oh, tall, tall, yeah, yeah, tall, but like completely in proportion. And uh, I was like, brilliant. So I took his details, sent his details on to the person that was doing the casting, and then three months later, there he is playing. Um, oh no, in fact, it was for it was for Rogue One. So it was even before the Force Awakens came out. Rogue One was the first one. And um, yeah, he was Chewbacca's stunt double because the guy that played Chewbacca was quite old by that point and couldn't be doing all, all the sort of running around. So they got in this guy. What? So I'm going to, when I ask you this question, I'm going yeah. to check the cameras. So hang on. The, in those films, yeah. the original Chewbacca from 77 or yes. 79, whenever this yeah. he was still playing Chewbacca. No, there was another guy. Right. They, oh, no, they got a replacement for him at some point. Uh, during The Force Awakens, he was. Yeah. Um, I can't remember when the older guy, because I think he sadly now died. Peter Mayhew was the original original actor. Peter Mayhew. Peter Mayhew. Excuse me, Bristolian. Second? Oh, no, the Bristolian was. Bristolian was. C-3PO. No, the Bristolian was Darth Vader. <coughs> that was the Green Cross. Green Cross Code Man. So normally, normally in my brain, these names come to me so quickly. And today, for some reason, it's like mud. The original, uh, David Prowse. I know why it is. David Prowse. Because you're um, intimidated by... By your sexy voice. Uh, Power of Edge. <laughs> I think it's the socks. I think it's the, bright, <laughs> the brightness of your socks that are kicking me off my game. No, so David Prowse was the original Green Cross Code Man. Great big guy. He ended up being Darth Vader. Um, but he was only Darth Vader in body. He was dubbed by James L. Jones in the final edit because <laughs> David Prowse was from the West Country, so his voice was very different to what Darth Vader's is like. So, um, And apparently, I don't know if this is true, but apparently he didn't know that he was dubbed until he went to see the, pre- the premiere. I was like, Ira, that's not my voice. <laughs> that's a Bristolian accent for anybody that doesn't know. And it was, uh, yeah, James L. Jones. But yeah, so so anyway, back to the yeah. So um, no, I think a being being a stunt guy is is really cool. Being a stunt guy in the Star Wars films is pretty cool. Being the stunt guy for Chewbacca, that's like three levels of cool. Mm. Ask ask any ladies or the, or any guys who like that, the, that kind of thing. The stunt double for Obi Wan, yeah, Kenobi. In case people didn't know his surname, <laughs> the stunt double for Obi Wan in yeah. the in Episode One, Two, and Three. Yes was a reg bloke ex reg bloke he? yes oh. and he runs um i met him on the set of slow horses because he was running a stunt guy's air you're gonna ask me i can't remember mate he's got a weird greek name um and he runs a st- he runs a, a stunt oh and yes. 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 yes 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 he runs the british action academy yeah that's right yeah yes i d- i didn't know i thought he was Oh yes, no, he was because yeah, because the other guy was edge, yeah. a guy called I didn't know he's Power Edge, um, or did I? And I've forgotten. There's a guy called Ray Park, Ray Parks, who was the stunt double for who was um, Darth Maul, and it was Ray Parks <laughs> and Andreas that were the stunt doubles, and then there was a sub coordinator. His name was. To look at Andreas, you wouldn't think he was ex-military. We're going to segue you into think, somewhere I, I want to go with this. I think it? he was reserves. Um, I could be wrong. Or oh, he no, did no, it no, 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 no. He was regular. I spoke time. to him, yeah. Cause oh, I, really? okay. Yeah, I don't know how I found out. We were on set chatting and, and I don't know how he was... Maybe one of the stunt guys told me he was, he was ex-reg. Mm. And then we were chatting. He, I think he was ex-2. He's either two or three. Anyway, to look at him, mm. you wouldn't think he was ex-military. I mean, he'd been out probably that long. He mm. probably didn't serve very long. I'd say probably. He just didn't. He, he's had a long career in TV and film. It seemed like, and he didn't seem like, you know, just, you, know you can tell people have been a long time and those who haven't. He just, he was, he knew more about Civ, Civvy Street than I did, which mm. is not. Um, and he had a long, he's got long hair. He's not particularly tall. He's got long hair. Yeah. Uh, he looks like a fucking hippie. I've not, I've not seen him in, um, since I started, probably about, uh, probably about six years or so. Um, he didn't have long hair then, but obviously hair grows. Yep. Uh, but no, he's he's a he's quite a well-known stunt coordinator. Do you, do you take that? Go on. Then. Are we recording? Yeah, yeah. Are we're you recording yeah, yeah. I'm going to wear them. I was gonna yeah, put- oh, we're back in. We're back. Yeah. Sorry, we had to stop there for an urgent call. Um, <clears throat> uh, hang on. Where were we? Oh, uh, Andreas. Yeah. Anyway, the point is going with this. Right. So coming on to, uh, I really want to discuss this with you today. Um, 
people leaving one of the one of the things sometimes it pops into people's heads they see people like you and um they think oh i would like to be uh, I, i'm ex-military let's become a military advisor to tv and film or a military advisor in general for just general things is it that easy what what general things can you be uh advising this is what people this is what people think no no, no yeah, advising yeah, yeah, like yeah. companies and how to be secure in hostile environments or oh, that's different. Yeah, yeah 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 no, oh. that's more security but yes um i for, specifically for film and tv i would say uh there the opportunities to be an advisor are not that stable so if you need a full-time income uh, I wouldn't advise it because it's quite boom and bust. You can be working non-stop for a year and then have a break for four months where you don't have a gig. Um, so it is, you've got to really love the job and really want to do it and really love film, which is why I do. Um, there are loads of opportunities in the film and TV industry that are not advising, um, where the mindset is crucial. Um, and the way that a film set runs is very similar to the way that a military unit would run in terms of it's chaotic, there are lots of changes, um, there's lots of different departments working together, uh, lots of different specialties. So military people can find it quite comfortable. It's very easy to switch from, in terms of the mindset, it's very easy to switch from the military to film and TV. The difficulty comes from film and TV in general it's quite difficult to get into to begin with. You need to do a lot of um, low paid jobs to start with at entry level and then work your way up. The good thing is, is in general, you don't need any qualifications necessarily to do it. Most of it is about being a good person who people can get on with, somebody that works hard, somebody that doesn't just, it's not your nine to five job. So if you're looking for that, definitely don't do it. But it's it's something where that kind of mindset of everybody working towards a common goal um, can really, really help and everybody clubbing together. Certainly it is that way in, in British TV and film. When it comes to US productions, it's a little bit different because everything is much bigger. Um, all the jobs are much more defined and so you can't necessarily step outside of your lane. Oh, really? So that that can be quite difficult. I find it, I struggle, or certainly used to, when it is on a big production where you're only there to do one specific thing and you see something else going wrong or somebody that needs a hand and your natural instinct is to step in and help. But you can't, you're not allowed to. It's it's union control that gets all very sticky. Why do you think it's different like that then, the States? I, th I think it's union union controlled. So the the, uh, the US in general is very unionized in terms of um, all parts of industry, but specifically film film and TV. So um, they're very very strict about who does what job, and you can't be seen to be trying to do somebody else's job. People get quite quite offended, um, even if it's something simple like moving a box. I've, I've been on set and there's a box that has to be moved and I go to pick up the box because it's in the way of the camera and somebody on the other side of the set's like, no, don't touch that, that's not your job. So you have to sort of stand back. It's quite it's oh, quite, quite weird to deal with. But it's very alien to, it, it the, to the military mindset that we have in the terms of just get, it, get it done, just, everyone mucks yeah. in. You can understand why, because if somebody grabs like a lens and fucks up the lens, that's like tens of thousands of pounds. But if it's a wooden box, it's like, Okay, fine. British film and TV is very different in terms of the, the mindset's much more collaborative. Crews tend to be a lot smaller. Uh, lines tend to be a bit more blurred. And it's just, in general, it's um, I prefer it. But I know other people that actually prefer having their job <coughs> rigidly well-defined and departments, no cross-contamination, but, you know. There's pros and cons, yeah, isn't there? Pros and cons to both. How did you get into it then? So I, I always wanted to do it as a kid. Funny, you, you should mention The Usual Suspects. Watching The Usual Suspects as a kid. Oh, The Icebreaker, we mentioned that, yeah. yeah. For those of you that don't know. Um, patrons, you don't get access to that. It's great. You should really, like, the chat we've just had is stellar, worth paying for. <laughs> uh, the, the, watching that, I was, I was blown away. Age 15, 
taped it off of Channel Four, and I was like, that I, I've never I've never sat down and watched a film that made me just go wow. And so from then on, as like, I I started to get more and more into films, um, how films were made. There was a TV show called Faking It. Do you remember this? Um, for, for people who don't, it was um, somebody who was completely green to a particular job would um, get like a crash course over a few weeks about how to pretend to be that person and then they'd go and do it in front of a panel and they would uh, with some other people as well who were the were real at that job the first one I saw there was a vicar there's a bloke pretending to be a vicar and so they had to deliver a sermon in front of four other vicars and there were three real vicars and the panel had to pick out who was the fake very very fun show um, there was there was one about stuntmen and there were three trained stuntmen and this guy had to train up very quickly he was he was a sportsman had to train very quickly to do stunts and it was fascinating seeing how films were made at that point i was like I, this is something i'd like to get into and then 9 11 happened um and my path changed and i thought all right i'm I've, I've got to go off to the army that's that's where my my path is now um and I remember watching Dog Soldiers and looking at it and thinking the characterization, how these soldiers are acting is like how soldiers act, very much, very close. But some of the kit and equipment is just totally wrong. As, and it's like, isn't, isn't there somebody that, that helps film and TV get this stuff correct? And that's when I started to find out about Dale Dye who is uh, Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers. He's the military advisor on all of them. He's doing Masters of the Air. Platoon. Platoon was where he started. He's doing Masters of the Air, which comes out um, sometime into this year, I think. And started looking at what he was doing. I was like, that is where I want to be. When I come out of the army, that's where I want to be. And so spent about seven, eight years in the army and decided that enough was enough. So... Uh, started looking outside the industry um, and uh, just started off on set as a background extra um, doing World War Two films dressed as a German with a terrible haircut um, uh, and uh, now you just got a terrible haircut now I've just got a terrible haircut because <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's not a German haircut uh, and then and then just just being on set more and more people making meeting more and more people and just being proactive being helpful and people go oh okay this this guy's not a total idiot how did you end up on set as an extra and i prefer the term supporting artist thanks. supporting artist background <clears throat> artist um i uh the first time i did it was my sister so in in the meantime while i was in the military both my brother and my sister had started in the film and TV industry as well. Oh, interesting. By complete fluke. And that's part of what stirred me on to do it, because I was like, they're getting to do what I want to do. Uh, my brother... <laughs> Are you the youngest? <laughs> no, I'm the middle one. <laughs> so my brother, my brother was who got in first. He started as an unpaid intern. And uh, I, I, I remember somebody telling me, the guy he was working for said, you are terrible at making tea. So there must be something you're good at. And started handing him scripts to read and uh, write sort of... Big, lots of production companies get thousands of scripts every week and somebody needs to wade through them and do the initial skim because most of them aren't... They aren't up to standard. So doing the initial skim to, to, to get away the chaff to try and find those little nuggets, those good ones... So he started doing things like that and ended up making his way through through his own graft up into the industry. And now he he uh, he writes. My sister uh, turned thirty and decided she hated her job and went and started to be a runner on set and progressed from there. But she was doing she was doing a film. Uh, this is while I was still in the army, and I was looking at starting in the industry. So I went on set with her uh to help her so i was an unpaid gopher so i'd go and fetch stuff for her explain what a runner is for people please. so runner a runner is sort of a base entry position where you are somebody that just sorts stuff out you go and fetch stuff so 
be it sorting out teas and coffees, sorting out water, uh, maybe blocking off a doorway. So if you're filming somewhere, blocking off a doorway so other people don't accidentally wander onto set or slam a door. Basically, bitch. Take. A set bitch. Um, Male or female. It, um, just because your sister was doing it. Yeah, no, you. it, it, is, it is the base yeah. entry position. It's where everybody starts. And it, so it's the it's the behind the camera equivalent of being an extra an extra is the baseline start point in front of the camera no i wouldn't say so no because an an extra an extra is really is is kind of a a dead end job there's no progression from extra you don't progress from extra to actor it's not you know some people do lots of actors do it but it's not a career path if that makes sense i know that's going to surprise you uh for someone who's looking for a career in TV and film, mm. seriously, yeah, then I would have thought that's one of the start points. It is because you get experience in front of the camera, experience on set, and Absolutely. you get uh, you get pocket money to go and pay for courses and whatever else you want to do towards being an actor. It does, but it's never it, it's a it's a really good way to get an idea of how the industry functions. But mm-hmm. it then doesn't lead you on to anywhere else. Nobody's going to pluck you from the extras pool and put you on set as a camera operator or oh, but up, you know, up behind the camera yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah no no but, but even in front of the camera you being an extra on set isn't considered a route to acting oh okay which is it's it's a strange one but um no, i'm surprised by that yeah it's a, a lot of actors will start off their career by doing bits of extra work yeah but it doesn't it doesn't it officially doesn't count as acting it is you know, there are people. Well, who, it's not. There are people. <laughs> there, well, acting, there are people that do it as a professional extra who've been doing it for years, and that's great. Um, there are people who sort of dip in and out. There are people that do it for extra cash, but it's not. Being an extra isn't going to turn you into an actor. It's not like that's a natural progression. Yeah, I wanted weird. my star on Hollywood Boulevard next year, <laughs> and you just scuppered those. Scuppered no, those. no, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining you where to put your your no, energy you've into. Part my yeah. bubble, mate. I was literally, I was no. gonna, I was gonna down tools anything else I do and become an actor. There are, there are lots of people who have been extras who, who've become <clears throat> actors, of course, but it's not a guaranteed route to success. Um, oh, what is? But being a runner, once you've been a runner for for a few years, you can then move up to something called third assistant director. A third assistant director is um, somebody that controls the background of the set. So the way the set's made up, you have the director who is concerned about the performances and about what the camera sees. You have the first assistant director who is the person that controls the set. So gets everything in place for the director and the actors to be able to perform. Yeah, the set. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so they're they're like your sergeant major. They can they control everything. They put the cameras in the right place. They make sure everything is set up for the director. The third assistant director is then sort of the right hand man of the first assistant director. So the third assistant director will normally um, get the background artists, the extras in the right place. Where's the second AD? Set vehicles. The second AD is the weird one. The second AD is back at the base and the second ad is doing everything behind the scenes to get everything on set for the first oh. which is i've always thought it's a bit odd because it's not necessarily they're they're quite different skill sets the second ad is planning forward planning um it's the next a little scene. bit uh, not even the next scene maybe in the next day and the and the, and the week so yeah. And then the producers are doing next scene, beyond next that. shoot, whatever. Yeah, yeah okay, exactly. They're thinking next one location. step ahead, or getting the actor from their trailer into hair and makeup to get them onto the set for the time that uh. the first AD needs them for that particular scene. You know, they're sort of tying, bringing everything together for the first AD to be able to do what they do. So, whilst the career career progression is third, se- second, first, that's not necessarily a linear progression because of the different skill sets required. Interesting. Third and first are, are very similar in what they do. Second is is sort of almost backroom, um, more organisational uh, in terms of planning rather than on the day. Um, and then, but but also, assistant directing is not necessarily a route to directing. There are lots of directors who just start at director. Director is the creative vision behind how something looks and sounds and feels. Whereas first, second and third are getting everything logistically together in order to make that happen. Okay. So I understand director and one first, second and third idea. Yeah. Right. Explain 
the producers to me. Aha. Uh-huh. So there are many different types. Because some of the stuff you explained there, I thought yeah. on the first or the third AD, or, or even the second, yeah. that the producer would be doing. So the producer will be doing <coughs> that. So you have different types of producer. So at the top, you have an exec. An exec producer um, is, um, it could be anything. It could be somebody that has given money to the production. It could be somebody that has the contacts that have been required to get particular actors onto the production. An exec producer credit can often be a reward for something, for helping out in in a big way. Um, uh, so execs won't be necessarily on set. They may come to set once once a week or so, see how things are going. So an excellent example of that, recent example. So Gareth ellis was a recent podcast guest. Yes. And he was an exec producer on Kajaki, which many people who listen to this or watch him would have watched, obviously. Okay, as an example. Great film. Yeah. So go on. Uh, so, uh, so his role in Kajaki, I, I don't know, he, but he probably wasn't on set every single day. Go on. He might have been. I don't know. Execs can they 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 can basically. I'm trying do to remember that. I wasn't they're on the, set. <laughs> at the top, they're at the top of the tree. They're, they're, they can they can come and go as they please. Um, oh, Gareth was it? He was. He was. Yeah. Out, he was. Uh, yeah. He was on set every day. So he can be. It, he that's was, that's yeah. entirely yeah. within yeah. his within yeah. his thing. But an exec will normally be um, be elsewhere. Then you have the producers below that, and the producers are the people who are on the film from start to end, and um, unless they are a development producer, but they can be they can be getting together the, the <coughs> excuse me bless you they can be getting together uh, the right writers to help with the script. They can be they're the people that will hire the director. Um, they are the people that will get in all the talent. So uh, the actors, the heads of department, people like that. So your director of photography, the producer will be the person that brings them all together. Uh, And uh, then you have the line producer. So the line producer is below the producer. Line producer deals with um, the budget and where all the money goes. So the line producer is more legit logistics than a producer a line producer will be getting together right how many trailers do we need on a particular day how many cameras do we need all sorts of those things so the line producer will be running the budget and deciding which departments get which part of that pot um, and then you have production ma- managers uh, so they sit below that and they again are dealing with more day-to-day logi- logistical logistical operations of actually sorting out stuff so making sure everybody's got somewhere to park uh making sure that the core sheets are sent out anything like that making sure that everybody's working off the right script anything like that so it's, it, as you go down the levels it gets less creative and influence based and more log- logistics and practical based and then you've got some various shades in between so coming right back mm. You ended up on set with your sister. Yes, uh, acting as a runner. So I was I was just holding off doors, making the, the cast and crew tease, so brew bitch, uh, and uh, trying not to get in the way. Uh, and then <laughs> it was it was filming in a nightclub in Watford called uh, called Oceanas, which I'd never ever been to when it was a nightclub. Thank God. Mm. Uh, but um, a lot of the background extras that they'd got for this sort of club scene were slightly more senior than the than the setting dictated oh so how did they mess that up it's miscommunications somewhere along the lines people's pictures being maybe out of date by a few years it can be it can, <laughs> it can be anything well when it comes to extras um you know you you, you don't necessarily know exactly what you're going to get until they walk through the door but anyway, it got to the point where they were like, we need somebody who looks like they could be in this club. And so they went, you, do you have a shirt? I was like, well, I do in the car. Yeah, it's like, right, go get a shirt on. And not that I wasn't wearing a shirt. I mean, like a, like a shirt with a collar, something that would be in a nightclub. So I chucked on the shirt and I had to walk through this scene with um, uh the lady who's now Doctor Who and Daredevil. What's um, so Charlie Cox and Jodie Whitt- Jodie Whittaker? So I had to walk through the scene with them and basically not fuck it up and just keep walking in a straight line, walk up some stairs and not do anything weird. Uh, and so that was my first 
thing thing as an extra and then they had a scene where a police car had to arrive and people had to arrest somebody and i got chucked into a police police kit for that as well so that was my very first of sort of taste of it and then as i was leaving the military i had some free times like right i need to get on set to see how things work so i signed up to an extras agency and uh, they put me on set as a german soldier so ended up on a on a british tv show as a german soldier and the second ad who's the person that, that books all the extras <coughs> uh was there was there was a guy who was a who was a bit strange is the best way to describe it um and, an extra yeah and um <laughs> i was basically put in charge of him so right you are to keep him away from the cast that was <laughs> <laughs> that was my job and it was it was just um like he, he's causing like kept introducing himself to the director oh, and this on. this is a huge set and this german director who was like who is this person is and he he kept telling everybody this story about how he'd been kicked in the head by a horse and like to anybody that would listen and people that wouldn't and he it was supposed to be it was supposed to be all soldiers all real soldiers and um there was a guy from the royal anglians and this guy who who kept talking about how he'd been kicked in the head by a horse and he admitted that he'd lied on his cv and had never been in the forces and this royal anglians bloke was going to kill him and so i was sort of standing in the middle of him like because my job was to protect this guy i was like why are they still hiring him why is he kept being brought back day day in? and it, it was insane but i but from that um the guy said okay you you know you're clearly not a moron not a moron not a complete moron and so brought me back in for something else and then i get i met more people and you know gradually the kind of things i was doing got bigger and bigger and bigger the kind of people that knew me got bigger and bigger and bigger and it was it was very quickly on we, we i was sort of looking around set and, and the extras handling firearms this is the other thing that the guy who got kicked in the head did he left his gun like lying in the middle of nowhere and uh, and so a bit like quick as a flash grabbed it before anybody saw and went and sort of sellotaped it to his hands um but the, the in general the, the firearms handling and firearm safety wasn't to the standard that i thought it would be or thought it should be Com coming from the forces where everything is done very well everybody's trained everyone's tested as well I found it a bit odd that real guns were being used in a very lackadaisical way. So I and a lot of people were were wanting to learn how to use guns safely, but there was nobody who who offered it um, because nobody could find a way to do it and make money from it because it was quite expensive to hire a range and to take people onto it. And a niche requirement, so you know. Yeah, quite niche as well. And no but nobody was requiring it. No <coughs> no productions were saying you have to be firearms trained and uh up to this standard. So we started doing because we felt that it was the right thing and gradually more and more people started to come our way and the kind of people we were training sort of went up the ladder. So starting to train more and more lead actors. And so that's so that's really how it started just slow and steady and each job getting a little bit higher up the road so you first start you started off then as a fire fire training fire people to use firearms uh authentically on screen that and it sort of happened at the same time where productions were looking for people <clears throat> who were firearms trained and genuinely firearms trained going back to the guy who lied about being in the forces um you know people ticked box saying yes i'm firearms trained because they knew they'd get on set and get some extra cash i can imagine that happens yes, all the time and probably because 90 percent of the time you get away with whatever you bullshit about yeah exactly because it's not just you know tick the box and firearms tick the box next military it's all sorts yeah. of stuff isn't there yeah um yeah, yeah interesting so so there there was nobody it was it was like for for big sequences where you're needing a hundred people that's absolutely fine but when you've when you've got five or six people working with the lead actor in close confines with real guns you suddenly need people who are a lot more switched on a lot better trained and you're generally not going to find those through an extras agency so it was it was people coming to us saying do you know any more people like you that you can bring on to set 
But yes, I do. And so that's how we started providing people for set. And then it, then it was me taking a step up and becoming sort of advising the production whilst supplying the people. So I would go on to set, bring a team of six people. The six people would play soldiers and I would stand behind the camera and advise the production on how those soldiers would move, how they would be used. And then I would sort of lead that team and go, okay, guys, this next shot, we're going to do this. So a lot of it is sort of hanging around, listening to what's coming up and sort of working out ahead of time what these guys are going to be doing and briefing them up and getting them ready and rehearsing so that when they hit the ground running, you're not going to waste any time trying to trying to put together some complex movement behind the camera, sorry, in front of the camera, but behind the actors. It all happens seamlessly. And whereas usually it would, would, you know, you'd have to train a bunch of extras, take maybe an hour or two, and they would still look a bit ropey. So this, this <coughs> seemed to me like the, the logical thing, a sensible idea. Um, there, were, there were other companies like myself um, going on set as a background extra. There were other companies supplying, you know, hundreds of people or 50 people. But there was nobody doing five or six really good people. So we decided that's what we would do. We're never going to be do big numbers. We're only going to do small numbers. We're going to do small numbers of very well-trained people. So that's how we started getting a name for ourselves. And so all of that started coming together. And then we, we got asked for things like Spitfires, <laughs> tanks, armoured vehicles. Oh, to provide Spitfires? Yes. Did yeah. you have any at the time you were asked uh, in your garage? No. <laughs> Zero. But I, <laughs> I had... I, I had enough contacts in various places that I, I could very quickly get together Spitfires. And so this, I, it was, How many? Because <laughs> one would be a challenge. I got, together, I got together seven. Jesus. Two, two were real. Two were real and flying. Five were, mo were models, but full-sized replicas that looked real. So real that people walking along the line couldn't tell which was the real one, which was the fake one. Wow. Um, but, and, and that I had... I had about 10 days to pull that together. <laughs> and I was I was in Brazil at the time when I got the phone. Oh, was it Brazil? I was somewhere I was somewhere on a uh, a joint forces sailing expedition and we got the phone call saying can you can you find us some Spitfires? We're having a bit of trouble finding Spitfires. And we didn't know at the time it was the same time that Dunkirk was being filmed. And uh, I now know the guy who was who was finding Spitfires for Dunkirk, and he was ha having trouble finding Spitfires because we had hoovered them all up for that particular two week block. Um, but th just being able to answer questions, being able to find out the answers, being able to find the right people. Um, I, I'm never g going to know all the answers as an advisor. I can't possibly, but I'll know who to go and talk to. So I'll say right. I don't know enough about this subject. However, talk to this guy here. He is the person you need to talk to. And then putting them in front of the, the crew. So that tends to be how it works. Interesting. I love it. I love yes. the, I do love the, internet. I think in a, in a past life, I'd want to be, I, I want to do it as a career. I think it's not in a past life, in a different life where I could accommodate the kind of lack of routine that that kind of industry provides, right? You know, because there's, there's another thing to it. Another side to it is that you made the you made the point earlier about, and the reason I'm talking about this, is I know people think about going to the industry, right? And you made the point earlier about, uh, you know, having regular income. And I've dipped my toe in different different types of jobs over the last, well, you know, 10 years since I left. And the ones I found most, I, I disliked most, were the ones where it was, it wasn't long-term contract. It was mm. paycheck to paycheck, yeah. as in, and he didn't know what the value would be, or it was, or it was entirely commission based, and it wasn't like a base base level mm. salary. And I found that um, it was, that was so far removed. It, it just introduced a concern in my mind that I didn't have when I was in the military, for example, mm. or that most people don't have in like a nine to five job. Your paycheck's coming in; it's always coming in, and you and you're gonna have a, you know, for example. They got to give you a minimum of twenty-eight days or like ninety days notice before they can sack you. For example, a redundancy, yeah. and that is not not the case, and um, and it's entirely down to other things, which it's, is hard. It's hard. It's completely freelance, and the the trouble is, a production can ring you up and say, <clears throat> "Are you free next week?" And say, are you free tomorrow? Are you free tomorrow? Are you free next week? And then on the day before, they go, "Actually, no, we don't need you." 
and suddenly that's your that's your your week's work gone, mm. and it it's and you've turned down other things because of yeah, it. yeah, exactly. Or you've been keeping yourself free. It's just it is it's not easy. So that's why I wouldn't recommend advising because an advisor at the end of the day is a nice thing to have. It's not a necessity. If you don't have an advisor, it's not going to be the end of the day. It it sounds to me like the 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 best advice for someone really wanting to get into the TV and film industry, come out of the military, mm. would be get on set in whatever capacity you can. Get understanding the industry, how it works on set, and on different sets, because not every set's the same, not every production's the same, on different sets, do that. And then get an understanding and then reevaluate where you think you want to be. Yeah. If you want to be in the industry and where you think you can find yourself. Because you could, you know, someone could go into it and think, yeah, I want to be, I want to be doing what Bags does. Or they could be thinking, I want to be a fucking actor. But then when they dip the toe into the industry, get on set as an extra or, or manage to get on set as a runner. Or put classic example of what you did, get on set and pay, just get on. Just call on the favour, get on set with someone else, get mm. experience in it, and then and then ask the question, right, what do I really want to do? Is it for me? Because mm. there's loads of opportunities in it, isn't it? I, I, you know, I used to love when I was, when I used to love, back in my career. Very, <laughs> I'm just a fucking clever. I've only been on, I've fucking done one production. And, um, but, well, you were very good in it. I was <laughs> most excellent. I'm still in it. Yeah. Seasons one and two of uh, Slow Horses. There you go. Yeah. Call me up. Uh, supporting artist bags. Yeah. Supporting That's artists. Very, very important one. Um, do you know what fascinated me? The the cameras, as mm. as geeky as it sounds, oh my god, the technology, and all wireless now as well. Yeah. There's just there was I spent hours, you know, because you wait you wait around a lot mm. a long time. I said I would spend hours just looking at the kit on the trolleys and on the cameras and attached and trying to work out what the fuck is going on. How is <laughs> where's all the data going? How is that doing yeah. that? What are those knobs for? I could never I'd never want to ask the questions. Yeah. I'd never I mean if I was going into Korea I'd be asking all the questions, but I think no, I don't it, want to ask it'd them. be like it'd be like wow. jumping on a train and going and asking the train driver, what does that do? It's like I'm driving, yeah. fuck off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's um it, definitely you get get on set in any capacity yeah. you can. If you get on set as an extra, that's the easiest way to do it and probably the best paid entry position because it's unionized there are certain amounts they have to pay you per day which is about about 100 110 pounds something like that but it's not regular so those of you listening going 110 pounds a day that's amazing because that's like a, a junior captain's wage or um a warrant officer's wage but the problem is they're not paying you that every day in the military you get paid that every single day monday to sunday Whereas a film set, you may be, you may have a month where you don't get on set. So don't look at it as a daily wage compared to your army wage because it's it's not comparative, especially when you get discounted food and accommodation within the army. So don't look at the numbers and go, brilliant, that's super big bucks. I'm going to j- jump ship. Um, look at it like if you were only working a week a month what would that look like? Yeah, you'd probably need, if you were going to go into it, I think you're leaving the military, you'd probably need to have six months to a year's worth of salary in your bank yeah. to sit, to rely on while you try and get yourself into and that, mm. and that at minimum. Yeah. You're trying to get, get yourself into a position where you're bringing in enough money on a, on a you can't mm. even look at it monthly, can you? Like on a quarterly basis. But if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about a, a career in the film and TV industry, and there are many, many opportunities for veterans out there for sure, then take a few days leave. Sign up to an extras agency. There is loads of them out there. Sign up to an extras agency. It doesn't have to be doing stuff as an army person on set because the problem is with if you just stick to that, you won't get enough work. <laughs> so extras stuff, there's all kinds of all kinds of work out there. As long as you are reliable you turn up, you don't look, you, but basically as an extra, you don't want to draw the camera. You don't want people, people sat there watching the film and noticing you, you, because then they've pulled away from the actors. So if you're nine foot tall with size 20 feet, they're probably not going to pick you for stuff. But if you look fairly generic, you've got a good chance of being used. Um, and then there are niche jobs as soldiers as well, but those are less. But as you say, yeah, get do it early so you can see how it all works. As an extra, you're not going to get as much access to what the crew are doing. As, as a runner, that's probably the, the, the best job. As a runner on set, because there are runners at base as well. So the base is where, uh, 
where everybody gets changed, where the, ca- the catering is, all of that stuff. There's runners on set on on base, and you'll see how the the, the back end of it works, behind the scenes works. But you really want to be looking around the whole thing. So being a runner on set, you're able to see what all the individual bits of the crew are doing. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the mindset, the mindset is key. The mindset, yeah. An important, an important point on this is that, um, now I haven't experienced this because I haven't, I've only been on one production. Although I've experienced, I, I, I was across two different directors over the two different seasons. But from, from talking to the other guys, I was on, on set and, and um, people on set was talking to her and it, apparently that was a great production to be on to be part of because it was just it, the, i mean i remember the director the director went off and got all the extras coffee because one of the ballsy extras it, it was a um african guy ex-military african guy i mean he was a gobshite <laughs> but funny gobshite and he was kicking off we had been on set for six hours he was kicking off because we hadn't been able to get a brew it was uh, night as well yeah, yeah. yeah well yeah but then grabs the director. He goes straight <laughs> to the director. So, you know, it's, yeah, I know. Mm. Uh, I can't remember the director's name. He's a great guy. He comes over, he said, there's no coffees. We haven't any brews. Like, for fucking six hours. And, he, and the director went off and got the brews. Uh, but the point being, it was a great set to work yeah. on. Apparently not all like that. But the, it definitely changed when the second director came and the extras got treated like shit. Yeah. Generally, weren't looked after as before we were. Uh, sorry, one other point I want to make. Um, you mentioned about doing it when you were still in. Mm. When I was on, when I was working on that production, there was a guy there uh, called Joey. Joey is a serving soldier. He's a PTI. Mm. And he spends his weekends and his leave doing extra work. He's raking it in and he's learning loads for from when he decides to get out. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll stop there because you wanted to say a bunch of stuff there when I was monologuing. No, I was wanting to say about, about how a film set operates, <clears throat> like the mentality of... of how people are treated, how people work together comes from the top downwards, comes from the producers and the directors and the heads of department. And so you, and sometimes the size of the set as well. The, in general, the bigger the set, the harder it is because there's so many people, you're just a tiny part in a big machine. Um, but it's like a regiment in the, the, the way the CO operates changes how the regiment operates so if the co is pushing everybody too hard and not taking care of the troops grumbling start to happen people don't work as hard people find ways to cut corners and things same on a film set if 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 the director is taking care of people making sure there's enough breaks you know the the the, the director is the captain of the ship so if the director decides we're going to take a half an hour break here everything stops same with the actors some depending on the size of the actor in terms of their career not the sizes in how big they are uh they can sort of say no i'm not happy let's take a quick break and everything stops so in that situation where the where where the guy went we haven't had a brew in six hours if the director cares he'd be like crap let's get some teas on set you know if if people are genuinely going if they're not doing as well as they could be doing because they're not being looked after. The director or the producer has the power to stop things and to change things. But normally that doesn't work. Normally speaking directly to the director to say, I'm not happy of from, I from that. That's like a trooper going up to the general and going, can I have Monday off? Rain, <laughs> rain stew again. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, in, in isolated circumstances, that can work, but usually it doesn't. Um, but every film set is different. It's different because of the people are different, the time scales are different, the pressures are different, the budget's different. Um, just because it's got a bigger budget doesn't make it better. But in general, people need to look after each other. Because sometimes we're so hell bent on get on trying to get something made that people don't look in all directions; they only look forward. Mm. Yeah, we've got about ten minutes to go. Blimey! Yeah. Um, do you enjoy what you do? I love it. Yeah. When it's going well, I love it. When it's not going particularly well. Um, and again, it's dependent on the director of, of, of how I get used. As I said, being an advisor is 
a nice thing to have. It's not a necessity. So some some directors will work hand in glove with an advisor. Some directors will ignore everything that they say and there's everything in between, depending on who the director is, what they're trying to achieve. But military accuracy, which is, is mainly what I do, is depending on the production necessary or not. If you're doing a war film, um, yes. If you're doing a TV show where there's a flashback and it just so happens to be that one of the people was in the forces, it's like, it doesn't really matter. This is not a crucial part of the show. You're just here to make the big things look all right. We're not going to stop or spend time or cash trying to get the small things right because <laughs> nobody cares. So most of my job is about knowing when to step in and when not to. What's it like dealing with a high profile, having been part of a high profile TV show um, that that is yet, that was, that is yet to be released. We know it's been released now. Yeah. So Rogue Heroes, yeah. what was it like? I mean, we worked on that in the run up to it, knowing it's very different to other military productions like that. Uh, what was it like? What was the anxiety like before before that <laughs> before that first episode of Rogue Heroes was released? Uh, it, to be honest, I when when the opportunity came up, um, my brain went two ways. The first one was, <laughs> "This will be absolutely brilliant, rocking around the desert in jeeps, blowing things up," and the second bit was like, "This is about the SAS. This story has never been told in this way before. Um, if." this goes wrong i'm in deep dog duty <laughs> and it was and because because the advisor gets usually gets a lot of the blame if things aren't correct like it's the advisor's fault it's like but the problem being is the advisor isn't always listened to for whatever reason and the advisor is just an advisor they can't make decisions they are they are they are there to advise everybody they don't get they don't get the power to choose so there will be often be things where I will give them the correct answer and but the correct answer is going to cost a lot more money and take a lot more time. Rogue Heroes for instance um, the planes they jump out of in, in episode 3 are Dakotas. Dakotas obviously didn't come in until later in the war uh, uh, but the planes they jumped out of were Bristol Bombays uh, and there are no Bristol Bombays that exist because they were all wooden canvas. Um, I think there may be one non-flying in uh, the RAF museum, but regardless, trying to get them flying, not a chance. So the production have the choice, do we spend a lot of money digitally recreating Bristol Bombays, which is actually more expensive than getting the flying ones, or do we just suck it up in the fact that we know that that's the wrong play? It may also be, as you know, that... that the correct way to do something will not look the way a director wants it to look and feel on screen. Yeah. Which we had that situation on, on Slow Horses. Oh, yeah. Tactical, tactical with, situation. With firearms and tactics, it's always the way, it's like, how would you normally do this? We'd do this. Okay, that doesn't look that good because yeah. I can't see you. I want you to be leaning out further. It's always the case with snipers hanging out of windows. It's like, well, snipers don't hang out of windows. Snipers are way back Bad inside. <laughs> snipers are way back, <laughs> way back inside um, the room. But then the camera can't see them. So it's it's always a balance between trying to tell a story and being accurate. And if being accurate gets in the way of trying to tell the story, then you've lost. Otherwise, it's a documentary. Um, but so so um, Rogue Hero is a brilliant favourite job I've ever done. But I was very nervous with taking it on because of the context. So I called up the SES Association and said, "This this is the situation." And they were they were well versed on it because. Um, they had um, given Ben McIntyre uh, the access to write the book. Um, they had been uh, been um, looking at the various scripts on the way through, and th their 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 attitude was: there's so many stories about the SAS. The truth is out there somewhere. We're not going to get involved. Knock yourself out. But if you fuck it up, we'll come and find you and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very, very, very nervous about taking the job on. And had it been a modern day SAS one, I wouldn't have touched it because, you know, that's not my area. I would have handed it on to one or two of the guys who, who I know who have much more experience in that area. 
Uh, but for me, it's a World War II story about the desert. And that's something I do know a fair bit about, bouncing around in vehicles. Uh, and so this is sort of much more within my wheelhouse than had it been a modern day one. So hummed and hard is like, no, actually, we, we will take on the job. And um, yeah, favourite job, best job, um, simply because the crew were great, the cast were great. I didn't realise the tone of it. And this is the weird thing about scripts, is when you read a script, you've got no, it's like the skeleton of something. You don't know the tone in which it's going to be. You can say something many di di different ways, as we all know through texting. People can misunderstand how you say something through text. Same with the scripts. You can have the bare bones lines on the page, but it can be said in a number of different ways. And reading the scripts, you couldn't really get a sense of what it was going to be like. It was only when we finished off the UK section, which was, we'd been filming for about two and a half months in the UK before we went abroad. They cut together like a quick teaser trailer of everything we'd shot. And the music was, as you see on the TV show, was sort of punk rock. Were you not aware of the music choices before that point? No. Okay. Nobody was. Because it's one of the main... Yeah. Of, of the people who didn't like the series, of mm. which there seemed to be very few, one of the points they had against was the mod music, yeah. which personally I fucking <laughs> loved. I loved, I loved it. Same. It's really <laughs> difficult to put together. And the, it, the, the... It didn't need describing to me, but the way it was described to me was the, the, the essence of the show is about being able to rebel and all those, the music of the 70s, that punk rock is all about rebellion as well. And so what these guys are doing is saying, fuck the system, I'm going to go do my thing. And that's exactly what the, mu the music of the era was about. It fits it perfectly. So when we, when we had this trailer cut together and, and it wasn't any of the action sequences, it was just snippets of dialogue snippets of scenes set to this 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 soundtrack we suddenly all went oh my god this is going to be brilliant we know what it's we know what it's like now even even watching the scenes you don't know how they're going to be cut together and so going to Mor morocco we had a much better idea of what the tone of the show was and um when I was very, I was lucky enough to be involved in the uh, the editing of the show again, which is the first time I've ever done that as well. So I got I got to see it being cut. I got to see it, I got to see it before any of the CGI was done. And um, yeah, brilliant. And and episode one was great. Episode two was even better. Episode three really hits its stride. It's like. This can't fail to be a winner. It's so good. What was the what? <clears throat> not to focus on the negative, mm. but, uh, but uh, um, what was what was the crew? Not the crew, the cast. Mm. So you, you, you know, obviously, I'm assuming you're mates with uh, a lot of the cast still, and uh, and I'm sure that relationship will, will flourish in the movie. <laughs> what about the the complaints about? the portrayal of Maine and mm. Sterling's personalities, because that was another big one that people had brought a contention about. I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm asking you not to, not to try and validate oh, why they were like this. It's not, I'm not, yeah. how did you deal with that? Because they've, like, they're valid things. Like if someone, if someone complained about the, the portrayal of someone's personality and they perceive it to be a different way, mm. then uh, it's absolutely valid, especially if you're Hereford yourself. Yeah. So there is, there is a huge amount of variation in how Sterling and Maine have both been portrayed over the years and I've ambushed you with this by the way no, so no, I apologize yeah, no, 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 it's, it's, it's a topic. great question sorry, it's a sorry, great sorry. Que question with Sterling so because of the clandestine nature of the SAS during the second world war um, most of what is known about the SAS didn't start to come out until the 70s really um, and it was after Maine had died, very sadly died in um, a car crash. And most of that initial, what was known about the SAS came from a biography of Sterling. Now, depending on what you read about Sterling, he is either a, a genius that saw something that nobody else did and um, was a bit of a sort of James Bond debonair a type guy on the left of arc going to the right of arc that he was a bit lazy 
um, that he maybe had the panache to get these kind of kind of operations off the ground, but didn't have the ta tactical understanding of how to to, ca to carry them out properly, and that actually most of it was done by Maine and and everything in between. There are many books written now about Sterling by some excellent writers. All of them are different. All of them give a slightly different view on that scale of who Ster Ster who Sterling was. And I think the TV show does a does a reasonable job of threading that difficult path, which is saying that I mean he's obviously a bit more stylish than the real Sterling. If you look at Sterling if you look at the pictures of him and look at the interviews of him, there are some, some interviews recorded of him in the 70s, I believe. Um, he, he's got a, an, an eyebrow that goes all the way across his forehead. <laughs> he's quite gangly. His nickname was the Giant Sloth because he was quite lazy and gangly. Um, he doesn't strike you as a, a, a military guy. He's, and everything in his background suggests that he was sort of lacking a bit of direction. And his older brother, Bill Sterling, um, who not a lot of people have heard about, uh, Bill Sterling may have been the one that drove the SAS forward in its very initial stages, and that David just happened to be the person who was in charge at the time when everything kicked off, because Bill Sterling got dragged back to London. Um, I don't think we'll ever know the absolute truth about who these people were, just because the kinds of people that would know are now dead, sadly. You've still got Mike Sadler, who, who is alive, but there are very few people who knew them intimately to be able to say what they were like and have written their thoughts down. There are snippets here and there. Every one of them is different. So I think the TV show does a good job of showing Sterling to be flawed, showing him to be quite flash, but actually not necessarily the best. <coughs> Sorry. When it comes on to Maine, it gets even trickier. And a lot of the discussions that we had about the TV show was the portrayal of Maine. So the, the David Maine, sorry, the um, Blair Maine you see in the TV show is a, a character. He's based on the real Maine, but he isn't Maine. Again, many different versions of who Maine was. And today you have people defending his reputation, saying that he was he was a scholar, he was a gentleman, he never swore. And then you have people on the opposite end of the scale who knew him saying he was a tactical genius, he was a leader of men, like people would follow him regardless because they knew how good he was. But when he drank, and he drank frequently, he was a different person, real Jekyll and Hyde. And he would wake up the next day not remembering anything he'd done, but be very ap apologetic about it because he knew he'd, he would have done something bad. And then what we have in the story is Maine being a bit more of a, re a rebel, a bit more of a... Another thing that, that the show sort of tweaks a bit is his background. He was from a similar kind of background of Lewis and Sterling. He was from a very middle class, upper middle class <laughs> family. In, in the show, for story reasons, to have more of a contrast with the character of Sterling, he's portrayed as coming from a slightly lower class background. So that there is that conflict. Good story comes from conflict. So they've tweaked the characters very slightly to make their interactions more exciting, more different. So I can understand why people would be upset and annoyed with the character of, 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 of Maine being portrayed the way that he is. Um, but it is for story reasons. Nobody sets out to make a show where you defame the people who you're, who, who, who you're trying to portray. or trying to tell a story and you're trying to tell the best story that you can. Yeah, I think uh, coming to close in a minute, but I think in, yeah, it's an interesting point. Like I, I, I don't think that 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 people who know nothing or very little about the SAS or even like Second World War antics that went on, I don't think anyone w would watch. Or not many people would watch that and think bad or think ill 
of the yeah. SES, for example, after watching it when they knew very little before. I think, you know, the opposite. Um, uh, but sometimes the people who are, you know, people who are emotionally invested in that think otherwise. It was certainly the way with Kajaki, we, we mentioned Kajaki and, and the iceberg on start. It's certainly the way with that, you know, people involved thought otherwise. And, um, or some people like were involved in the day thought, but it's because you just, you, it's hard to get something perfect, right? It's hard to retell mm. a story perfectly. And then it's hard to retell a story on film perfectly mm. as well and make it entertainment at the same time. I don't know what point I was trying to make there, to be honest. But uh, I thought it was fucking brilliant, mate. I genuinely did. I genuinely did. Like, I, But then I go into it thinking about the entertainment factor. Mm. And the music, when the music dropped, <laughs> I, well, we, in fact, we, we had a screening, didn't we? We had yeah. a screening in, uh, not far from the recording yeah. now. But well, I enjoyed it. Um, and the music is brilliant. Was, yeah, it's so it's good. good. The, and it's so easy to get wrong as well. That could yeah. have gone, if they'd, that, they if, they, if they the music, could've... if they got the music wrong, mm. it would have fucked the whole thing. There were so many opportunities in that TV show for it to go wrong. It was such mm. a high risk thing, which is why I was slightly cautious about taking it on in the first place. But I think they did a fantastic job from start to end. The, the What I think the good thing about it is it is has ignited people's interest in the topic. So if, if people have enjoyed watching the show, go and read the books about it. Go and form your own views about who these people were from actual, not from a drama on the BBC, but from history books. Mm. Go and actually read into the subject. If you're interested, there's so much more. That show could have been four times as long and still not crammed in all the stuff those people did. So, so go and read up on it if you've enjoyed it and learn more about it. Excellent. And then uh, going back, so one give a give a one liner piece of advice for people wanting to get into TV and film. Ex military wanted to get into it. Start point. Where do they start? <laughs> start point. Where should they look for information on how to do what they want to do? Uh, there's a company called Screen Skills. So we had Gareth, Gareth on. Yeah. You had I said we you had him on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had him on. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of we'll weird. Take that out. Uh, <laughs> Gareth um, used to work, is working for a, a company called Screen Skills. Screen Skills are all about uh, training people for that first step into the industry in a place that is remarkably difficult to make that first step. So they have all sorts of courses on there. Um, I know some X Forces people have gone and done their courses um, that have enabled them to get that first step. So, ha so have a look there. Um, get experience as a runner. Find out if there's a local production to you, because um, if you're local, that really helps. If there's a local production filming, get in touch with them, say, do you need any runners? Do you need any anything like that? Um, yeah, getting that first step is hard, because it's. but once you've got your foot on the ladder, once you've started talking to a few people, then it gets easier from there. Yeah, that's a rubbish answer. I know that was it's several difficult. lines. It's difficult. Was several lines. Oh, sorry. Was it a one-line answer? Yeah, it's all right. Uh, Bags, right? People can find you. Oh, beararmsfilm.co.uk. Uh, just beararms.co.uk. Beararms.co.uk, and you're on on Instagram, on social media at beararmsfilm. Excellent. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, great to see you. I'm glad. To, glad to got we, we got to do this again. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. There was something else I wanted to mention. I can't remember. I've got a t-shirt for you. I've got one of your bare arms t-shirts, which fits very well. Yeah, they're very good. I think I know why. Yeah, I know where it came from. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I've got a uh, I've got a HR t-shirt. I need to give. Yeah, but I couldn't read that. I've got. I bought. I bought one. I bought Have one shirt. Yeah, I should be wearing. Oh, you it. moron! I should be wearing. I owed it. you one because you gave me a bare arms one. Uh, I didn't think about that. That's right. You're not having the money back. <laughs> <laughs> cool. A sales a sale. Good luck with me, and good luck with uh, future production. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you for watching the H-Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I 
do with each guest that last about five, ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.